Good evening once again. We'll start now and uh, hope that your friends get to join the class along the line. Now, before we start, I would like to be sure that everyone can see my screen and can hear my voice. So put up your hand if you can see my screen and if you can hear my voice. So, okay, all right, um, okay. All right, so a few of you can, okay, okay, that's fine, all right. So we are sure that uh, you can see the screen and you can hear our voice clearly. So that's all right, you can you can put down your hands and then we, we continue from there. So, uh, for those who started the semester right from the beginning, this will be your last lecture for the semester. And for those who joined last week, after this lecture, we'll go to the beginning of the semester, all the way to where you joined the, the class last week, so that you finish up and come to the same level with your mates who started the semester right from the beginning. Um, today, we are taking the last topic on the, the course outline, which is biotransformation. In other words, drug metabolism. Now, even though I said drug metabolism, it does not necessarily mean it is the metabolism of medicinal substances. So it can be the metabolism of any chemical substance aside the metabolism of the biomolecules, which you have studied earlier. I mean, those biomolecules such as carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, uh, nucleic acids, aside the metabolism of those, we have the metabolism of chemical substances that get into the body, just like you have metabolism of those biomolecules generating energy in the body. Now, the overview of biotransformation is such that if you take any chemical compound from outside of the body, that chemical compound is referred to as xenobiotic, as we'll soon see, xenobiotic coming from the external environment of the organism. So if you take this box as the internal environment of the organism and Outside of it is the external environment of the organism. Anything which comes from outside into that organism is a xenobiotic, a chemical that is getting into the body. Now, if the chemical is taken into the body through ingestion, that is through the oral cavity, by oral administration, for instance, the substance gets into the gastrointestinal tract and gets absorbed into the bloodstream. Now, after the process of absorption into the bloodstream, generally that is occurring in the small intestines. Some of absorption occurs in the stomach, but most of it occurs in the small intestine. You have a distribution of the chemical substance through the bloodstream. So the bloodstream now carries the substance to various organs and tissues. Now, even with that distribution, you can have the chemical substance binding to some plasma proteins, or you have it binding to some receptors on cells and having its therapeutic or toxic effect after that substance, which is a ligand, 
binding to a receptor now could have its toxic or therapeutic effect on that particular cell of the tissue that the substance had been transported to. Or you can have the substance getting to the liver where biotransformation occurs, where the metabolism of that substance occurs. So biotransformation occurs in the liver. And then the metabolites of that substance now can have a therapeutic or toxic effect. And after that, the substance can get excreted out of the body. Now you realize there is an arrow that curves around the biotransformation. And that is because after distribution, you can have the substance acting directly, having that toxic or therapeutic effect directly, untransformed, the untransformed part of the substance, having that therapeutic effect directly before getting excreted again, untransformed. Or you have, as I said earlier, after distribution to the various tissues and organs, there is that metabolism of the substance. And of course, that metabolism uh, it can be catabolic or anabolic. In other words, it can be a breakdown of that substance, or it can be a conjugation of the substance with another substance to form a conjugate, to form a complex with that substance before there is that uh, therapeutic or toxic effect, or directly it gets excreted out of the body. So this is the general overview of what happens to any chemical substance that is entering into the body. Now, even though I have referred to a xenobiotic, that is a substance that is coming from uh, the external environment of the organism, biotransformation can also occur with endogenous substances. So substances that are synthesized within the organism itself. Those are endogenous substances. They can also undergo biotransformation. Now take note that this whole process of absorption, distribution, biotransformation, which is referred to as the metabolism of the substance, and then the excretion of the substance out of the body falls under the field of pharmacology, which is referred to as pharmacokinetics. That is what the body does to the substance when the substance gets into the body. So generally, when you study, say, pharmacology, you'll be studying pharmacodynamics. That is the effect of a substance on the body. That's what the substance does to the body, the effect of the substance to the body. And then you have also the broad branch of pharmacokinetics, where you are studying what the body does to the chemical substance. And those are specifically absorption, distribution, biotransformation, and then excretion. So when you look really, Biotransformation is that one stage of pharmacokinetics that is referred to as the metabolism of the drug, specifically in the liver. Right, so if you have a substance, a chemical substance that is entering the body, it can enter into the body through various routes of entry. So the various routes of entry could be oral through the mouth. And if it is through the mouth, it gets into the gastrointestinal tract. And in the gastrointestinal tract, either it is excreted out of the body with fecal matter that is untransformed. Just like when you, you take in food, you have some part of the food that is undigested. 
and get excreted in stool. The same way you can have a chemical substance which is taken orally that get, goes into the gastrointestinal tract and gets excreted with fecal matter untransformed. Or from the gastrointestinal tract, some part of that chemical substance gets absorbed into the bloodstream in the stomach. Some, the most part of it, gets absorbed into the bloodstream in the small intestine. And that is because the small intestine, as you will soon see, is having the largest surface area with some foldings, which is referred to as the villi, increasing the surface area of the small intestine in order for it to increase absorption. So you have absorption in the small intestine of the chemical substance into the bloodstream. And the blood carries the substance to various organs and tissues. And in the liver, one of the organs, the liver, that is where you have the metabolism of the substance. And there you have some of the metabolites of the substance now uh, uh, getting excreted into bile that is stored in the gallbladder. And later with bile, the metabolites will then be excreted into the duodenum, again, back into the gastrointestinal tract, and then excreted out of the body through stool. Now, you can also have a route of entry by inhalation, that is through the nose. So if it is by inhalation, obviously, it gets into the lungs, and the lungs have these small pockets referred to as alveoli, which are packed with capillary tissues. And these capillary tissues absorb the substance which has been inhaled, and then the substance can bind to some receptors, have its therapeutic or toxic effect, and then later can get exhaled, either transformed or untransformed. The substance is excreted out of the body with exhaled air through the nose. Another route of entry can be intravenous, where the substance is injected directly into the bloodstream. So it gets into the blood and part of it can get absorbed into the lymph. And from the bloodstream, you can have the substance going to one of the organs, the kidneys responsible for filtration. And from there, it goes to the bladder where it is stored for some time. And then it is excreted with urine. Or again, even by intravenous administration of the drug, this drug would get into some extracellular fluid and from there can get excreted by the some exocrine gland like the exocrine glands of the skin and you have this sweat gland uh, causing the excretion of the drug through sweat. You can also have again from the extracellular fluid where you have the substance having some interaction with the cells of the organs. And these can be happening, having effect either on soft tissues or bones, which are hard tissues. You can have the substance getting stored in adipose tissue, and that will occur if the substance is lipophilic. It can easily get absorbed and dissolved in the adipose tissue, which is largely made up of triacylglycerol. And this triacylglycerol is lipid. And so you have these lipid substances getting dissolved in the adipose tissue under the skin. Right. So after you have the drug entering the body, 
as I mentioned earlier, the pharmacokinetics of the substance that is referring to what the body does to the substance, the various stages that the substance goes through, absorption, distribution, metabolism, which is biotransformation, and then excretion of the substance. That process of pharmacokinetics can be presented on a kinetic curve such that you see this kinetic curve represented either in its logarithmic form or just uh, on, on, or, or, or on a chart of uh, the graph of concentration against time. These two actually represent the same thing. The only thing is that sometimes when you have concentrations being very minute, you have uh, this graph being converted, you have the concentration being converted into into the into log into log values to 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 represent that uh, relationship between concentration and time in blood. So what you see is that you have a first curve, the first kinetic curve, which is labeled one. This first curve labeled one. If you come here, that represents the kinetic of a substance that had been taken in intravenously. And what it means is that if a substance is taken directly into the bloodstream, right from the beginning of the time, the time from the beginning here, you see that concentration is very high in blood. And gradually, the concentration of the drug drops all the way until it is completely excreted out of the body. Now we have the, the phase where the drug is high in concentration, where it will be having its therapeutic or toxic effect being labeled as the alpha phase. So this alpha phase, this is where you have the concentration of the drug uh, at its uh, ma uh, optimum and having its uh, optimum or maximum therapeutic or toxic effects. And gradually, as the drug undergoes biotransformation, it's metabolites. And those the, the, the part of the drug that also gets excreted out of the body untransformed. Once that excretion is occurring, you have the concentration of the drug reducing all the way until the concentration of the drug becomes zero. That refers to a complete excretion of the drug. And that stage of elimination of the drug from the body is what is labeled the beta phase. Now, that is intravenous. But if you have the substance taken into the body by oral administration through the mouth. First of all, from the beginning, when you take the drug in, as we saw earlier, that substance that is taken into the body, first will go into the gastrointestinal tract, have some absorption of it into the bloodstream in the stomach, and has most part of it absorbed into the body, into the, into the bloodstream in the small intestine. And as absorption is going on into the bloodstream, you have the concentration of the substance increasing. So from the beginning, you have absorption, you have the concentration being very low, and then grad, and then, it, it starts to get absorbed into the bloodstream and you have that steep increase of the concentration of the substance in blood all the way to its maximum concentration, its optimum concentration, where it begins to have its therapeutic effect. And then as biotransformation occurs and elimination also begins, you have the drug being excreted out of the body and that represents the beta phase. So you have these curves actually showing that kinetics of the substance 
in the blood, how the, the, the concentration of the substance is changed over a period of time. So if the substance enters the body, maybe over a period of six hours, a period of 12 hours, you can have the substance getting eliminated completely out of the body. Right. Now, how about substances that are taken with repeated doses? Because what we just saw was just a substance entering into the body once and then getting absorbed, getting distributed, getting metabolized, and then getting excreted out of the body. But in general, there you have some, like if we take medicinal substances, drugs that are prescribed, for instance, in hospitals for you to be taken with repeated doses. Maybe you have to take the drug uh, in the morning. You After every uh, four hours, you have to take the, the same dose again or a lesser dose. You are given a, set, a, a certain uh, a dose regimen that take this drug once after meal in the morning, once after meal, that is after lunch, and then once after dinner, for instance. Now, what really happens with that kind of uh, dosage, with the pharmacokinetics of the drug, is that if this is the beginning, again, it is, it is uh, kinetics of concentration against time, what you see is that you have the first dose that is represented here, D, the first dose taken at the beginning, and you have the concentration of the drug increase up to a maximum. And you realize that when elimination begins and you have the concentration of the drug dropping, and you take a second dose, if you take another dose, if you take another dose of that substance, then what happens is that you have the concentration of the substance increasing again to an optimum before beginning to fall. And you have that continuously. If you are having a repeated exposure, a repeated administration of this substance over and over and over again, what happens is that you are maintaining a certain level of the substance in the body to have its therapeutic effect so that below that, that interval, the therapeutic effect of the substance may be negligible or really you, 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 th there is no longer any therapeutic effect at a lower concentration than that concentration within which the substance should be with repeated doses. Now, you see that there is that interval, the maximum, optimum, and then a certain minimum of concentration of the substance when another dose is taken. That interval is referred to as a safety corridor. It is within this safety corridor that you have therapeutic effect of a substance. Above that, you may begin to experience a toxic effect. And below that, you begin to experience not a therapeutic effect, not a toxic effect. So if a substance does not have a certain concentration to have its therapeutic effect, it may not do what it's supposed to do if it is being taken in as a medicinal substance to serve a purpose. And we also see that there is another curve which is drawn right through it. This is just to represent an average uh, dosage. So this is an average dose of the drug. The dose, that is the average of the maximum and the minimum of the substance that should be having a therapeutic effect. So that is with repeated doses. Now, so you see, we have been talking about therapeutic effect, toxic effect. Indeed, we can even have lethal effects, which 
of course means fatality when the concentration of a substance is so high that it results into death. So that in toxicology, you have the, the toxicity of a substance actually very much dependent on the concentration of the substance. So a substance may not be toxic below a certain concentration, but then could become toxic at a particular concentration and can even become a lethal substance at a very high concentration. So for instance, a common drug such as paracetamol is therapeutic to have its analgesic effect if its concentration in the bloodstream is between 10 to 20, concentr uh, 10 to 20 milligrams per liter. And around 400 milligrams per liter, that substance, which was serving a therapeutic effect, could become toxic and even could become lethal at about 1,500 milligrams per liter of concentration in blood. You see such, you see such phenomenon for other common drugs like aspirin, phenobarbital. In fact, men just about any drug, any chemical that you take into the body or that you get exposed to will have some toxic effect within a certain concentration level and even lethal effect within a very high concentration level. Right, so we can also have factors that influence the route of administration of a drug. So that depending on age, for instance, depending on gender, depending on body weight, the route of entry of a drug will be chosen depending on these factors. So for instance, a drug that is given to an adult orally could be given to a child in the form of a suppository. Or if it is by gender, for instance, there are certain drugs which are injected intracavitary. So a male does not have a uterus. The male does not have a vaginal opening to have such a drug inserted into him. So of course, that drug is going to be administered through a different route to the male. Similarly, you have drugs that are dependent on body weight. You know, you, for somebody who is, let's say, obese, for instance, if a drug should be uh, uh, is supposed to be administered and maybe the drug is supposed to be administered intravenously, and you have another type of the drug. Maybe you have the, the, the tablet of the drug which could be administered to the person. If the veins of the person could not be found, for instance, then of course you could have, for instance, the administration of the drug maybe through the mouth. If there is not going to be any enzymatic effect on the drug in the gastrointestinal tract or through other means. Right. You can also have the properties of the substance like molecular weight, how, how large the molecules of the substance is, the size of the substance, or even the chemical structure of the substance can determine the route of entry of that substance. Of course, that chemical structure also that is having some physiochemical properties and even the form of the drug, whether it is solid, whether it is liquid, whether it is gas, will determine the route of entry of the drug. If it is gas, of course, it is going to be by inhalation. If it is liquid, perhaps it could be taken in by oral, that is by ingestion, the oral route, or maybe it can be taken by intravenous uh, route, for instance. So these can actually influence the route of entry of drug. 
something like environmental parameters. So some of these, for instance, can have effect on uh, people in their old age, such that perhaps temperature or humidity might be causing maybe some uh, dryness of skin of some people in old age, such that a drug uh, will have to, to be administered uh, maybe uh, subcutaneously, or it has to be uh, administered directly thermally on the skin. Some quantitative characteristics that can also affect drugs could be the, the, the time of exposure to that is needed for the drug to have a, a therapeutic effect. That is the contact or exposure time, which actually should, should give way for that therapeutic effect to occur within an individual. And that will also determine the concentration or the dose of the drug that uh, should be given to a person. If it is supposed to be given over a long period of time, for hours, little by little, mostly that is going to be given you know, intravenously. If it is something which should just be taken as a tablet once, and then it, it goes into the gastrointestinal tract and gets absorbed into the bloodstream and then begins to have its therapeutic effect. Then, of course, that will be the route of entry. So you can have a drug which is being taken like a drip intra, intravenously, and that exposure time obviously is going to be longer than someone who the drug is being given to, maybe just by a direct injection or just by the, an, an oral ingestion of, of, of the drug. All right, so these are some of the factors that can influence the route of entry, the choosing of the route of entry of a drug. So looking at this, we saw some of the routes of entry of the drug being the skin, oral cavity, the stomach, that is in the gastrointestinal tract. You, as the drug is taken in orally, it goes to the stomach, goes, goes to the small intestine, large intestine, the rectum. If it is a gas that is being inhaled in through the nasal cavity, it goes to the lungs. Now, each of these surfaces that have interaction with with the substance have different surface areas and thus will be influencing the amount of the substance that will have a therapeutic or toxic effect on the organism. So for instance, if you take the skin, the surface area of the skin of an adult is about 1.2 to 2 meters squared. That is about if a drug is, is, is being administered dermally, so topically on the whole body, the only surface area that you can, if you are applying it on the whole body, you have a maximum of 1.2 to 2 meters squared. That is the surface area on which you can have the substance being absorbed into the body or if it is to have that therapeutic effect topically on the body. If it is the oral cavity, the mouth, if the substance is, for instance, if the substance is to be taken sublingually under the tongue and it has to be absorbed in the oral cavity, in the mouth, the surface area which is available for absorption of the substance is just 0.02 meter squared. And that will affect the amount of the substance that gets absorbed per unit time. If it is being absorbed in the stomach, the surface area available is about 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 meters squared. Now I mentioned earlier that the small intestine provides the largest surface area for absorption of substances. And that is around 100 meters squared. And that is because you have the villi the foldings in the small intestine that increases the surface area of the small intestine to allow it to absorb 
maximally substances that enter into the digestive system. And that is specifically meant to have optimum absorption of nutrients into the bloodstream. And it does so even for chemical substances that are ingested into the body. The large intestine has between 0 0.5 to 1 meter squared. Largely is it what have, it's responsible for reabsorption of water out of fecal matter, the undigested part of food or the digested, uh, the undigested part of food, which is to be excreted out of the body. You have the large intestine having reabsorption of water into the body out of it. The rectum also plays such a role. It's having a smaller surface area even than the, the, the large intestine. Drugs that are taken in, or if it is even a toxic substance which is being inhaled in the environment, you have a surface area of the nose, the nasal cavity of about 0 0.01 meters squared. Not really much can be absorbed directly in the nasal cavity, but rather that gas goes into the lungs, which is second to the small intestine. In the lungs, we saw earlier, is having these small pockets packed with capillaries, blood capillaries, referred to as the alveoli. And these pockets also have such large surface area, about 70 meter squared, also have very high absorption of these substances. Now, after the substance is absorbed into the body, these substances interact with the cell. And there are various mechanisms by which the substance permeates the cell membrane into the cell, into the cytoplasm, and has its effect in these cells. Remember that the holistic effect of a substance can be at the cellular level, it can be at the tissue level, and it can be at the organ level, and with organ systems. So it can be a whole, maybe the whole of a nervous system, the whole of the digestive system. But even with that, you see that the effect will actually be at the lowest level, which is the cellular level. And together, those minute interactions that it will have with the cells will now be translated into the effect that it will have on a tissue. And that will also now have that holistic effect on organs and organ systems. So you have here three different forms of transport of a substance across the plasma membrane. It's a biomembrane, which is a bilipid layer. And you can have simple diffusion of the substance across the, the plasma membrane. This usually will occur with a substance which is lipophilic, especially because you have these uh, biomembranes being lipid bilayers. And so if you have a lipophilic substance, that lipophilic substance can easily diffuse through that lipid bilayer. You can also have what is referred to as facilitated diffusion. Here too, you have the transport of the substance along the concentration gradient, except that it is not diffusing directly through the, the the, the biomembrane, but you have that diffusion being facilitated by a pore. That pore is made up of a protein, a biomembrane protein. So the protein is embedded in the biomembrane. And through it, you have an easier diffusion of the substance. And intentionally, you see that these substances have bigger sizes than the substances that 
uh, by simple diffusion across the plasma membrane. Then you can also have active transport of these substances. So, so far, simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, these are passive transport of the substances across the biomembrane. But with active transport of the substance across the biomembrane, you have the expense of the cellular energy ATP. So you see ATP getting hydrolyzed of one phosphate group. Remember, we saw this over and over again, that when you have some dephosphorylation of ATP, and a lot of times that dephosphorylation happens with that phosphate group removed going to phosphorylate another compound. That is a form of expenditure of energy which is responsible for the transport of the substance, again, through a protein embedded in the biomembrane. That is an active transport of the substance. So you can have these three forms of transport of the substance, simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and then you have that active transport with the expense of ATP for the substance to get transported across the biomembrane. You can also have what is referred to as endocytosis. And endocytosis, you see, is being divided into three different forms, where you have phagocytosis, which is responsible for the transport of solid particles. So you have the engulfment of that solid particle by the plasma membrane, which that engulfment now is being released out of the whole structure of the plasma membrane to form something like a food, a food vacuum, referred to as a phagosome. Inside here, you can have the breakdown of that substance. Here, for pinocytosis, it is the engulfment of fluids. Here is a solid particle, but for pinocytosis, it is the engulfment of fluids, which also is uh, turned into a vesicle in the cytoplasm where you can have a breakdown of the substances in that fluid. Then you can have receptor-mediated endocytosis, yeah. where you have receptors on the biomembrane that interact with the substances on the surface of the cell membrane. Mm -hmm. And there is that engulfing of the substance together with the receptors also into a vesicle. Wow. And then there will be a breakdown of these substances in the vesicle. Now, looking at biotransformation directly, Biotransformation is divided into two phases. Now, take your mind back to the basic knowledge of metabolism of substances like carbohydrates, proteins, lipids. You, you, you know that in metabolism of these substances, we refer to two major processes, which are catabolism and anabolism. Catabolism being the breakdown of these substances and anabolism being the build up of bigger molecules out of smaller molecules, where if you have, say, carbohydrates, such as monosaccharides, like glucose, building up to give you a bigger structure, like starch in plants or like glycogen in animals. You have that being anabolism. But when you have the breakdown of carbohydrates, a bigger carbohydrate like starch into glucose, that becomes catabolism. Now, a similar thing happens 
with the breakdown of chemical substances so that you have phase one of biotransformation representing that process of catabolism of the chemical substances. And you have phase two, which is conjugation. That is formation of conjugates or formation of complexes of smaller substances together. That becomes anabolism. So what you see on your screen is a simple representation of the major processes of pharmacokinetics, which we saw earlier. So that if you have a xenobiotic, a substance which is coming from the external environment of an organism, the substance first gets absorbed and when it gets absorbed, it undergoes some distribution to the various tissues and organs, and then biotransformation occurs in the liver. And that biotransformation is what you see being divided into phase one and phase two before you have that process of elimination, which is excretion of the substance out of the body. Now, what you see with phase one is that you can have that substance, that xenobiotic, in phase one, as it gets metabolized. The metabolite, the substance that comes out of that process of metabolism will have the activity being altered, different from the xenobiotic itself. So what I mean by that is that you can have a substance which is having some therapeutic activity but after it, it undergoes metabolism, it is either you have that therapeutic activity reduced or the therapeutic activity is increased. Or as you see here, you can have the substance becoming non-active. So you have a non-active metabolite altogether. So you can have a non-active metabolite altogether or you can have a metabolite which is active, but that activity is increased or reduced compared to the activity of the xenobiotic itself. It can even be that the xenobiotic itself is inactive, and that will be a prodrug, so that it is after metabolism that you now have that substance, the metabolite, out of that uh, process of biotransformation becoming an active drug. And then you now have a conjugation with some other endogenous substances. These are substances that are synthesized in the body. They are not xenobiotics to form conjugates. And generally, conjugation, what it does is to make the substance more hydrophilic so that the substance can easily be excreted out of the body. Mostly you have these xenobiotics being lipophilic, being lipids, so that if they are lipids, they will not be able to be excreted easily in the aqueous, say, urine, for instance, or aqueous sweat, for instance. They will have to be converted into substances that are water-soluble. And by conjugation, you make them become that hydrophilic substances that will easily be eliminated or excreted out of the body. Right, so we have the phase one reactions of biotransformation divided into three major categories. And these are oxidation, reduction, and hydrolysis. Now, of course, oxidation and reduction will always be occurring at the same time. Even back in senior secondary school, you studied redox reactions. That is because any time there is that process of oxidation, you will also be having reduction because oxidation of a substance will result into the reduction of a different substance. 
and vice versa. So you have these oxidation processes like hydroxylation, decarboxylation, formation of oxides, desulfurization, dehalogenation, oxidation of alcohols, oxidation of aldehydes. All of these are occurring in the cytoplasm specifically in microsomes, which are some vesicles attached to the endoplasmic reticulum in the cytoplasm of the cell. Reduction also occurs with aldehydes. It also occurs with nitrogen atoms, which may become amine groups. Reduction of nitro compounds also, which would become amine groups after their reduction. All of these are also occurring in the cytosol or in microsoft. Hydrolysis is about splitting of molecules. So that, of course, you understand clearly that all of this is catabolism, breakdown of the substance into smaller substances. So it can even be the breakdown of amide bonds could be a peptide which is being broken down into smaller peptides. All right. Now, we take a look at some specific examples of the phase one reaction. And the first we are looking at is ND alkylation. That is a breakdown. It's a breakdown. So we see a prodrug, codeine an analgesic, codeine. Codeine gets transformed into morphine. Morphine is more of an analgesic than codeine. Indeed, it is morphine that has the analgesic effect that is experienced when codeine is administered. So you have morphine having about 10 to 20 times of analgesic effect than codeine. And what we see is this. Now, if you take a look at this, this group, CH3 group here, the CH3 group here, you realize that in place of that CH3 group, you now have a hydrogen atom replacing it. That is a removal of this methyl group. This CH3 is a methyl group. And you remember that methane is called an alkane. And if it is an alkane, the residue of it is an alkyl. That is why you, you see the, the term dealkylation. Of course, this particular process is not N dealkylation. That is because you are having the removal of the methyl group from an O group. This is an oxygen. So if specifically you are referring to this reaction of conversion of codeine to morphine, you will say in place of N, there will be O. That will be representing the oxygen atom. So that will be an O D alkylation. But there are two N D alkylation processes occurring here where you see codeine also being transformed into norcodeine. So that you see this on this nitrogen, on this nitrogen, you see an alkyl group. That is a methyl group. And here, that methyl group is removed. Again, you see it being replaced with hydrogen. That is an ND alkylation, removal of an alkyl group. You see the same thing here from morphine. You see this methyl group removed from this nitrogen. That is also ND alkylation. So you can have a drug substance that enters the body and is going through different routes of biotransformation. It doesn't go through just one route of biotransformation, but different routes, as you are seeing with codeine as a pro-drug, getting converted into the active drug, which is morphine, having 10 to 20 times more of analgesic effect than the codeine itself. 
and then even further, morphine gets converted into normorphine with that removal of the alkyl group or norcodene also uh, having that removal of the alkyl group. It is morphine that has that analgesic effect and not of any of these other metabolites. Right, so these other metabolites will just get excreted out of the body together with, say, uh, normorphine, which after its activity, if some of it can get excreted also out of the body, even codeine itself, some of it can get excreted untransformed. Then another common phase one reaction is the oxidation of alcohols and aldehydes. So an example we are seeing here is with ethanol. So this is ethanol under the action of alcohol dehydrogenase. You realize the hydroxyl group here is getting oxidized so that in place of this hydroxyl group, you now have an aldehyde group. This hydroxyl group now forms a double bond O and you now have acetaldehyde being formed. That is an oxidation reaction. And you see I mentioned earlier that anytime there is oxidation, reduction also occurs. So you see the coenzyme NAD+, which accepts electrons, gets reduced to become NADH. And further, you have acetaldehyde getting oxidized to acetate, where you now have the aldehyde group being converted into a carboxylic group. This group you see with carboxylic acids. And here too, you see the coenzyme NAD plus getting reduced to NADH. So that is also a phase one reaction occurring generally with alcohols. Not only ethanol, these can occur with methanol, propanol, butanol, all these alcohols in that homologous series will go through similar reactions of conversion to an aldehyde, acetaldehyde, if it is ethanol, if it is, say, uh, propanol, it is going to form that uh, uh, propanaldehyde. And then it is going to form that propanoic acid. Right. Now, we take another practical process of metabolism. I know this can be intimidating, but you need to take your time and look at it critically. Step by step, I will take you through. So you, you don't necessarily have to just be looking at the whole molecule and then get intimidated at it. As you can see earlier, when I started, I was looking at specific functional groups. I, did, I was not looking at the whole molecule. I was just looking at some specific portions of the molecule that are removed and being replaced by others. That is all you are supposed to focus your attention on. What is being removed? What is being replaced? And then you can tell whether it is oxidation, whether it is reduction, whether it is hydroxylation or whatever. You'll be able to tell. So let's take this is another drug, antipyrin, another analgesic, antipyrin, also a non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory drug. Now we see that this methyl group here, you see the methyl group here on this five-sided ring, this methyl group is being replaced by, uh, so one of the hydrogens here, here you are having CH3. One of the hydrogens is now being replaced with a hydroxyl group. That is an oxidation reaction, just like you saw earlier with the, the process 
of oxidation of alcohols. First, you saw that hydroxyl group being replaced by a double bond O, and then you now saw that double bond O, which is an acetaldehyde, now being oxidized further to form a carboxylic acid group. So that if you have antipyrin being converted to hydroxy methyl antipyrin, just because you are having that substitution of one of the hydrogens here with the hydroxyl group, that is an oxidation reaction. If you go further to the, to the number four, which is carboxy, no, that is hydroxy antipyrin, four hydroxy antipyrin. What you notice is that you are having this CH2OH group now being converted, that is oxidized. So you can look at this as an aldehyde group, which is being oxidized further to give you a carboxylic acid group. So that is an oxidation path. Now, if you take this, again, antipyrin, this root, what you see is that this methyl group on the nitrogen atom in this ring, this methyl group is removed. And in place of it, you are having a hydrogen. That is an example of ND alkylation, which we saw earlier. That is ND alkylation. So one molecule is undergoing different types of phase one reactions. We have seen oxidation in this part. Now we are, we are now seeing ND alkylation in this path. If you take this other path, you see that there is no hydroxyl group on this carbon of antipyrin. There is no hydroxyl group. But with this path, you now have a hydroxyl group attached on that carbon. That is hydroxylation. That is also a phase one reaction. And further, if you have another hydroxyl group attached on this carbon, so you now have a hydroxyl group attached on this carbon, that is also a hydroxylation reaction. Then you will have that last uh, metabolite, which is dihydroxy antipyrin. It can also be that, yes, this molecule does not have the antipyrin does not have a hydroxyl group here, but here you now have a hydroxyl group on this carbon atom. That is a hydroxylation reaction. So you have here, in this part, you have this carbon getting hydrolyzed first before you now have this carbon getting hydrolyzed. But along this part, you have this carbon, which gets hydrolyzed first before this carbon in the five-sided ring gets hydrolyzed. And both of these paths lead to the formation of that last metabolite, which is dihydroxy antipyrin. So you can see these reactions occurring with only one molecule one substance entering the body, you have that process of oxidation along this path. You have that uh, process of ND alkylation along this second path. And you have the process of hydroxylation, which is occurring along these two paths. Right. We move on to the phase two reactions, which we we saw earlier that these were conjugation reactions. In other words, these were synthetic reactions or they were what? Anabolic reactions, the formation of complexes, bigger molecules. And that is referred to as conjugation, phase two reactions. It could be conjugation with glucuronic acid, conjugation with some sulfates, 
conjugation with acetyl group, which is referred to as acetylation. Conjugation with glutathione or conjugation with some methyl group. So that will be the opposite of dealkylation. If you are having what? Acetylation and methylation, that will be the reverse of alkylation, uh, of dealkylation, where you have the removal of the alkyl groups. But acetylation and methylation will be the conjugation of the alkyl groups onto the chemical substance. So we take example of a common drug, paracetamol, for instance, paracetamol. So this is paracetamol, also referred to as acetaminophen. And paracetamol, when taken 50 to 70% of it, and that goes the process of glucuronidation. That is the conjugation of glucuronic acid. So this is glucuronic acid, a residue of glucuronic acid. And you see in place of this hydroxyl group, in place of this hydroxyl group, you now have the glucuronide, that residue of glucuronic acid getting conjugated to the molecule of paracetamol. And 50 to 70% of paracetamol takes this part of metabolism under the action of some glucuronal transferases. Of course, that is uh, some complex with uridine diphosphate. That is why you see U at the beginning of the name. Of course, that is some deactivation of the substance. With this conjugation, the substance is inactive. It only gets broken down later in bile and gets excreted out of the body. You also have the process of sulfation sulfation, that is conjugation with sulfate group. So that again, in place of this hydroxyl group, you now see a sulfate group that is attached to paracetamol, giving you paracetamol sulfate. That is also an inactive uh, metabolite. Then you have the path where, so this part of sulfation, about 25 to 35% of paracetamol goes through that part. And you have about 5 to 15% of paracetamol undergoing the process of oxidation, which is catalyzed by uh, some cytochrome P450 enzymes in the liver. And you have the formation of uh, N-acetyl parabenzoquinone amine. This molecule, which is written in short as NAPQI, it is actually N-acetyl. N-acetyl because there is some acetyl group on the original molecule, which is also referred to as acetaminophen. And you see that that N acetyl parabenzoquinone amine. So the acetyl group is on N quinone because you are having this cyclic uh, ketone group. This molecule actually accounts for the toxic effect of paracetamol. It is this molecule if paracetamol is taken in some over as an overdose and you have more of these substances being produced these substances can then bind with some proteins of the mitochondria of hepatocytes that is liver cells forming some protein adducts which then results 
into oxidative stress. But in normal doses of paracetamol, this molecule quickly gets conjugated to glutathione. Glutathione quickly gets conjugated to this molecule, making it non-toxic so that the conjugate of it then is broken down in bile and then it gets excreted out of the body. Now, all of these paths really do not account for the therapeutic effect of paracetamol. It is only this path, which first of all is, it, it starts with deacetylation. Only one to 2% of paracetamol accounts for that therapeutic effect, that analgesic effect of paracetamol. And it undergoes, first of all, deacetylation. And deacetylation is occurring where? On the amide group. So you now have this end. You see this acetyl group is removed. That is why it is deacetylation. You can even say it is end deacetylation because the acetyl group is on a nitrogen atom. And you have now that group becomes an amide group. And so you have a paraaminophenol. You have the OH group directly opposite the amine group. That is why it's referred to as para. Amino is, is the amino group. And then, of course, you are having this uh, benzene ring, the hydroxyl group. That is a phenol. Now, this paraamino phenol now gets conjugated to a fatty acid which is arachidonic acid. That fatty acid is having 20 carbon. So it's a, a, arachidonic acid is a 20 carbon uh, fatty acid, which gives you this uh, metabolite referred to as AM404. In other words, this is, you can say this is n arachidonal paraphenol. Just as you have with here, para amino phenol. You can say this is N arachidonal. Uh, you can say uh, para, para phenol. This is a phenol. So this is what is responsible for the analgesic effect of paracetamol. This has that analgesic effect, that therapeutic effect that paracetamol has. So here again, you see various paths of metabolism. Now, apart from this process of deacetylation, deacetylation is a catabolic process. And so we can classify just this specific process of deacetylation also under dealkylation, and that will be a phase one reaction but all the others are conjugation reactions, which are phase two reactions. Right, so that is with paracetamol. Now you can have, so acetylation, acetylation, which is the, the conjugation of an acetyl group onto a substance. So if you take this aryl amine, that is an aromatic amine, and you have acetyl-CoA donating an acetyl group that gets bound on this amine group, for instance. You now have N-acetylation. And what you have here is an N-acetylated metabolite. And you have the coenzyme A now getting hydrolyzed away and being alone. And we'll see that N-acetylation plays some significant role in the impact of genetic disposition of individuals on the metabolism of drugs with some polymorphism of the enzyme N-acetyltransferase, which is responsible for the transfer of the acetyl group onto the aromatic amine that is in some primary amines. 
which are drugs like procainamide, for instance, like some drug like isoniazid, which is used for the treatment uh, of tuberculosis. We will soon see some specific examples of some of these uh, pharmacogenomics. That is the dependence of metabolism of drugs depending on individual genetic disposition. Now you see all along we have talked about metabolism of xenobiotics, but I also mentioned that you can also have the metabolism of endogenous substances. That is substances that are synthesized in the body. These substances are not coming from the external environment into the body, but they are actually synthesized in the body. Now, you remember when we were looking at the breakdown of hemoglobin, and we looked at the breakdown of the heme of that hemoglobin molecule, we saw that along the line, there was the production of bilirubin in that breakdown, and bilirubin bound to plasma albumin, and that blood albumin forming a complex with bilirubin, then transports bilirubin to the liver. You have that uptake of bilirubin into the liver, and in the liver, you have the process of conjugation with glucuronic acid. And that process of conjugation makes bilirubin now water soluble so that it can be excreted in urine so that you have a complex which is bilirubin diglucuronide which then is secreted from the bile into, say, the kidney. It goes to, in, into the, back, back to the, the blood. So once it comes into, with the bile, it comes back into the duodenum. And in the duodenum, these can be absorbed because now it is water soluble. It can be absorbed into blood. And then in blood, it can now be filtered by the kidneys and get secreted by urine or it can get secreted in fecal matter. So you see, this is bilirubin. And you see bilirubin binding with the plasma albumin to form that bilirubin complex in blood. And then it now gets water soluble and thus gets transported. Now in the liver, you now have two molecules of glucuronic acid. So glucuronic acid gets conjugated. So this is where you see that process of conjugation, a phase two reaction in biotransformation occurring. And that conjugation renders the molecule now water soluble and can be excreted out of the body either through urine as urobilin after you have the urobilinogen being filtered in the kidneys, get converted to urobilin and get secreted in urine. Or you have urobilinogen being acted upon by some uh, uh, microbial enzymes that are in the large intestines converting that to stecobilin, which then gets secreted, uh, excreted with fecal matter. So you have these two roots of the excretion of bilirubin out of the body. But the emphasis here with biotransformation is on this process of conjugation, where you have two molecules of glucuronic acid that get conjugated with the bilirubin molecule rendering it water soluble such that it can be excreted out of the body. That is a phase two reaction. It's a conjugation reaction. 
Now let's take a look at some significance of biotransformation in environmental science. So we have, first of all, one example. This example is a real example of a herbicide. This herbicide, I think this herbicide was, uh, was introduced somewhere in the 1940s, but by about 1970s there about, this herbicide was banned to be used. And that is because even though the herbicide was effective in the control of broadleaf plants in gardens, in parks, it was later found out that the hydrolysis, remember hydrolysis is one of those reactions in phase one biotransformation, phase one reaction of biotransformation. The hydrolysis of this compound, trichlorophenoacetic acid, which is that herbicide, the hydrolysis of it results into the formation of trichlorophenol. Now, trichlorophenol itself is not toxic. So the hydrolysis of it, you see there's that breakdown of this molecule into two. That is catabolic, it's a phase one reaction. You have the trichlorophenol and acetic acid. These are not poisonous substances per se, but the conjugation which becomes a phase two reaction, the conjugation of trichlorophenol, two molecules of trichlorophenol get conjugated to give you tetrachlorodibenzodioxin, which is commonly known as TCDD. So this molecule, TCDD, is a carcinogen. And this carcinogen is persistent meaning that it does not get degraded easily. It's persistent in the environment and thus can have long-term effects on the environment. So that is one significant aspect of the application of the knowledge of biotransformation in the environmental context. Let's take a look at another one where we have, again, a compound, paratime, which had been used as, a, a, this time around, not a herbicide, but a pesticide was used against certain uh, pests, uh, kind of in the family of uh, spiders, mites, and again, you see the hydrolysis of this forms paranitrophenol, diethyl, phosphothioate. These two, there are no problems with them. The breakdown of parathion into these two molecules has no issue with it, except that you have another route of metabolism biotransformation, which is photooxidation. Of course, the web suggests that the oxidation of this substance parathion occurs in the presence of light, specifically with UV light. So if you are using this substance in a park, in a field to control pests, obviously the substance is going to get exposed to sunlight. And you can have the oxidation of this substance. So you see that this sulfur atom is being replaced with an oxygen atom. And that forms what is referred to as paraoxone. And paraoxone is also a toxin, especially to mammals, which is also a known carcinogen. So that is also another example of the significance of biotransformation in environmental science. Now, 
there, there had been uh, the discovery of uh, some fishes having some masculine features. So female fishes in a river, I think somewhere in one of the states in, in the United States, I think that was Florida. Florida was having this river that it was noticed that the viviparous fishes, the female viviparous fishes were developing some masculine features. So they are fins. Those female fishes, they are fins were beginning to look like the fins of the male fishes. And they were also putting up some male behaviors. And when the this effect was being studied, it was realized that there was a factory that was located somewhere at higher grounds of the river. And that factory was involved in the processing of nuts and they release their waste products to flow along the river downstream. Now, the waste products from the nuts which were being processed themselves did not have that effect to cause masculinization in the fishes, but rather you have, it was discovered that this uh, waste from the factory was having some uh, plant estrogens, which were, no, not estrogens, plant, uh, let's say it's a, a plant lipids, phytosterone, phytosterone. And this phytosterol, even though it couldn't be having that masculinization, it was discovered that downstream in the river, there were some microorganisms, some bacteria that were acting on these phytosterol, causing enzymatic oxidation, such that the oxidation of this phytosterone was causing the conversion of the phytosterone into androgens. And we saw with hormones, androgens are male hormones. So that enzymatic oxidation, you can see that this hydroxyl group with phytosterone has now become this cyclic ketone group. And you see there is also a breakaway of this side chain from the ring structure. Perhaps if we look at the structure, maybe if you count the carbons, one, two, three, four, five, six, X maximum, this can be a form of dealkylation. It's an alkyl, even though this is a branched alkyl. So there is that dealkylation and oxidation occurring at the same time. Because in place of this, you now have a hydroxyl group and this gives you the structure of androgen, testosterone, which is a male home. And that was having effect on the fishes, the female fishes downstream, so that they begin to develop some masculine features and even put up some masculine, masculine behaviors. So that is also another practical example of the application of biotransformation in environmental science. Now let's go ahead and look at biotransformation and its uh, implications on health in humans. So that, for instance, we let's take a drug such as semitidine. So semitidine is a drug which is used for the treatment of heart burns and peptic ulcer. So it goes in to reduce gastric acidity goes to neutralize you know, the acid which is being secreted uh, together with gastric juice. But 
prolonged intake of cementidine, which will cause that very reduced gastric acidity, will result into bacterial and fungal proliferation in the stomach. And with the introduction of nitrates from food and drinking water, you can have these bacteria and fungi growing because of reduced gastric acidity, causing the conversion of these nitrates into nitrites. And further, you have that bacteria also causing the enzymatic catalysis of the formation of nitroso compounds. So those nitrates will then result into some other nitro nitrogen compounds, which are carcinogenic, and thus increasing the risk of gastric cancer together with that breakdown of the mucosal lining of the stomach walls, which of course results into the susceptibility of the stomach walls to inflammation. And if you are having that recurrence of inflammation because of the breakdown of the mucosal lining of the stomach walls, you have that increased risk of the development of gastric cancer. So that is that is another you know, practical example of the knowledge of biotransformation having impact on the health of a person. Even though a drug is being taken to, to relief to, to, for a treatment, a prolonged exposure to such a drug will be causing such a serious effect because of that process of biotransformation, which could be occurring this time around. This biotransformation is occurring by the action of bacteria in the gastrointestinal tract. Right. Then I talked earlier about the, the effect of some genetic disposition on the biotransformation of drugs. So an example is with isomiazid, which is uh, is an antibiotic which is used in the treatment of tuberculosis. Now, isoniazid undergoes N-acetylation. And N-acetylation, that process is a conjugation reaction, is a phase two biotransformation reaction. And this process of acetylation is catalyzed by the enzyme n acetyltransferase. Now, remember that an enzyme is a protein. And if it is a protein which is synthesized in the body, then of course, you can cast your mind back to gene expression that we studied earlier, that you have that process of transcription from the DNA to have a messenger RNA. And from the messenger RNA, you have the process of translation to give you that protein. Now, if you have any form of mutation on that gene, then of course, you can be having different structures of the protein being produced. And with this enzyme, you have some occurrence of polymorphism so that you are having different forms of the N-acetyltransferase. In some individuals, you have N-acetyltransferase catalyzing this reaction faster than the others so that you can have the distribution of individuals in a population into three different categories. So you have a trimodal distribution where you have individuals 
grouped as slow metabolizers of the drug. And you have individuals that are categorized as fast metabolizers of the drug. And somewhere you have in the middle intermediary metabolizers of this same drug. So what it means is that if you have persons having uh, the health condition of tuberculosis and you give them the same dosage of the drug across board, what will happen is that you have in the slow metabolizers the drug accumulating in the body and later could be causing some liver and kidney and some other uh, impairment of organs in the body of such individuals because of the accumulation of the drug in the body. Remember, it is going to be taken, the drug is going to be taken in repeated doses and the accumulation of this drug over a certain period of time will result into toxicity of the drug in, the, in, in such individuals. Some mild toxicity can occur also in persons that are having intermediary metabolism. On the contrary, persons that fall under the category of fast metabolizers will have this drug being metabolized really fast, getting excreted out of the body such that you have the therapeutic effect of the drug being lower than the intended effect that it should have. What it means is that you then will have to give customized doses to different groups of people. In fact, this is the future of medicine, referred to as personalized medicine. In other words, customized medicine, so that a person will, the person's genetic disposition will have to first be analyzed before a dosage regimen is actually developed for that particular person so that drugs are not just administered to persons with the same doses without taking into consideration the genetic disposition of such persons. So these are some of the future trends into what is referred to as biopharmaceutical analysis. I will urge you to really, it's, it's a very interesting uh, topic with biotransformation. So it, this uh, two-hour lecture on biotransformation really is very limited and cannot cover every single thing on biotransformation. There's so much with biotransformation to study, but of course, we have limited time and we can only go over uh, very few examples to actually understand this process of biotransformation. So generally what we have talked about is that biotransformation is divided into two different groups of reactions referred to as phase one reactions and phase two reactions. And the phase one reactions of biotransformation include oxidation, reduction, and hydrolysis. And that is to do with catabolism, the breakdown of the drug into smaller molecules. And then we have phase two biotransformation, which is conjugation, which is that synthetic or anabolic reaction where you are having the build up of complexes of these chemical substances with some endogenous substances. And we saw processes such as acetylation, sulfation, glucuronidation, glutathione conjugation, etc. We talked about the role of biotransformation in drug metabolism, where drug metabolism will result into either detoxification or toxification. Indeed, in some biochemistry books, biotransformation is used interchangeably with the word detoxification. But in actual fact, 
biotransformation does not only result into detoxification of a substance, as we saw, for example, with the metabolism of uh, paracetamol, we saw that there could be toxification from biotransformation of drug as, uh, as well as detoxification. So detoxification could occur, toxification can also occur. And we also saw some uh, role of activation of a drug, like a pro-drug, like uh, the example of codeine getting activated as morphine that is having more analgesic effect than the codeine itself. Or you have drug inactivation. Again, with that example of paracetamol, where we saw the different paths, glucuronidation, sulfation of the drug resulting into inactivation of the drug. Whilst we saw another route which resulted into the formation of a conjugate of arachidonic acid with paracetamol that is causing the activation of the drug. We also saw the application of biotransformation in environmental context, where we saw metabolism of pesticides and herbicides, ecopollutants resulting into, for example, the example of what happened with the fishes in a river in some states in the United States, Florida, whilst when we saw the conversion of some phytosterol into androgens causing masculinization of some female fishes, etc., etc. We saw some of this, the conversion of uh, parathion into paraoxone, which is a carcinogen. We saw these examples. Then lastly, we talked about the health impact, the health implications of biotransformation. We talked about this uh, genetic disposition of an individual and its effect on the metabolism of the drug, which we saw the, the trimodal distribution of populations into fast metabolizers, slow metabolizers, intermediary metabolizers. In some populations with some drugs, it's not going to be a trimodal distribution. It will be some bimodal distribution, which means there will not be any intermediary. It will, it will just be fast and then slow metabolizers. And we saw also the application of that into what is referred to as personalized or customized medicine, where dosage regimens are developed depending on the genetic disposition of an individual and not that the dosage regimen cuts across the whole population, which could be resulting into intoxication of some, whilst it is resulting into less therapeutic effect in some who are fast metabolizers of these drugs. So this brings us to the end of biotransformation. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, those who started, those who started the semester, this is your last lecture. So from now on, what you are going to do is to be interacting with materials which I will begin to put on the LMS. If there is uh, enough. Uh, space that I can put videos, all, all of these videos, even though I've given them to you, I'll still put them there. Uh, the, the presentation slides, the book chapters, all of them will be there. And then there will also be questions there that you'll be using to prepare yourselves for exam. Come after the uh, Christmas holidays, you'll be ready to write your exams. Those who joined us last week, will continue to have lectures from next week. From the beginning, what others had studied up to where you joined us last week so that you also come at par with those who started from the beginning before 
you 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 take your exams. Now I will uh, open the. I will I will open the floor for questions and contributions and uh, anything that anyone wants to say. So if you want to say anything, you can quickly raise your hands and then I'll call your name. You unmute yourself and you speak. We have only nine minutes and then we 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 close. So the floor is open now. Yes. Yeah, boy. Yeah, please. I want to ask if um the drug pathways or the routes by which you take the drugs. If there is, is what any, mm -hmm. the, the routes by which drugs are taken. Mm -hmm. Is any one of them more efficient than the other? Well, it depends on the type of drug that you are taking in. So it, it, it you can't just say that one route is more effective than the other. It depends on the situation. So you can tell that sometimes when somebody is sick of, say, malaria, depending on the infection of the plasmodium parasites in the person's blood, there is the decision taken either to give the person an injection or to give the person a tablet if there is supposed to be a very fast action of the drug, then there will be that injection into the, the blood directly, or you take in a tablet if there is no need for that. So really, it, you, you can't tell that it, generally one is better than the other. If that the, a drug, if somebody is, is vomiting, for instance, and you cannot give the drug to the person by oral ingestion, for instance, say children, for instance, a drug can be given to them as a suppository. So, so yes, mm -hmm. please. Is there um is there any side effect if, for example, um a drug that's supposed to be taken through um intravenous means is taken orally? So a drug that's meant for one um, means of in uh, intake. Is mm -hmm. taking through the other means. So there be any effect. Mm -hmm. So generally, uh, uh, drugs which are to be taken, say orally, okay, will have some coating, for instance. So that drug which is supposed to be taken uh, orally should not be having some digestive enzymes having some effect on it in the first place, that the drug will not be having its therapeutic effect. Now, that same drug, of course, is designed in such a way that it, it, it cannot be taken, say, maybe intravenously, maybe the concentration of it causing uh, high bioavailability directly into the blood can result into some toxicity. So that is why every drug which is developed, it is actually stated the route of entry. So you know that when you take this drug with this dosage, this is how you take it. Every drug has that. So you can't interchange. Like you take uh, a drug which is supposed to be taken uh, orally, and then maybe you just go and then start injecting it. No, you don't do that. Yes, uh, George. George. Uh, hello, Jose. Yeah. Hello, Jose. Yes. I wanted to ask um, with the time without um, will of a reaction with the drug. With the, um, so again, this again, is, again, it's not clear. With the trimodal reaction with drugs. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know so, in this case, if we don't know how the person reacts to drugs and then we give it, is it not really harmful to the person himself? And that is the reason why there is this new topic of personalized medicine, also referred to as customized medicine. Indeed, there will have to be an analysis to determine the person's genetic disposition and okay. 
this analysis, this biopharmaceutical analysis could be at the level of the gene, which is referred to as genotyping, or it could be at the level okay. of person's phenotype, which is referred to as phenotyping, to determine that genetic disposition of the person before you can determine the dosage regimen to the individual. Okay. But that is, of course, if the health facility that is giving uh, uh, that medication has the capacity to run such analysis. Do you have one? Okay. Okay. All right. So I think uh, it's, it's three minutes to nine. Uh, George, do you want to say anything again? No, please. I'm done. I'm done. Okay, so you can you can uh, mute and then you, you put your hands down. I I will uh, move the motion to bring the class to a close. If you are all in agreement, say aye. Aye, aye. But say hold uh, on a, a minute. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask whether the slides would they have available? Sure, sure. Soon? The slides are always available. And then the right. recording of the video. Yes, always. Right after the uh, on the after. ML uh, elements. Elements. I have not put anything there yet, but okay. I will begin okay. to put it there after this lecture. But I always share this with the class rep, and the class rep shares it with the group. The video, the, the slides, and then a book chapter over the topic which we have done. Sir. Yes, Bill. So all the videos you have given us, we have put them in our Telegram uh, group so members can access all of them there. All right. So that information is to the whole group that everything which all the materials which I have given out it's available to the group, so you can take it from the group. All right, thank you, Mills. Right, so uh, we we'll say goodbye and have a good night until those who started class uh, last week, we meet again. And the rest of you, you can start to prepare yourselves for exams with uh, all the materials which I've given you and the questions which I'll begin to put online for you to try your hands on. Goodbye for now. Goodbye. Have a good night, sir.